Apart from training nights from Corona, there were also several other benefits as well. For one, Corona citizens could get visas ranging from six to eight months' time, while regular people could only stay a maximum of three months instead. And if they were the royals of Corona, then of course, their time frames would be extended as well. The royals could get 1.5 to 2 years' time on their visas when coming to Baymart. Typically, when the visitors came, they were given visa I.DS that were enclosed in plastic coverings, just like regular I.D cards. The idea was that once they got into Baymart, they were expected to go to the Baymart Passport Office at District C. The office would measure their height, write down their eye, body, and hair colors, as well as take note of any distinctive marks around their faces and so on. Of course, since people grew regularly, rather than focusing on things lime height, those at the ports would look at their eye colors, hair color, facial marks, and so on. Without the internet or cameras, Landon had to think of a way to make the staff verify the identities of those who had passports. What if someone killed the owners of those passports and tried to get in using them? Security was very essential. Hence, they had to take down all distinctive features about these people. Right now, only few people knew how to sketch professionally in Baymart. And quite frankly, it would be nearly impossible for them to sketch hundreds and thousands of people quickly. So picture sketching was definitely out of the question. And in addition to taking down any distinctive features, the people would be asked to create a five-letter number code as well. Usually, when one opens a passport, the left page of the passport is empty, and the right page generally has the photo and visa details. For Baymard's passports, these codes would be on the left-hand page, and the other visa identification details like name and expiration date would be on the right. Anyway, for security purposes, this code would be printed on the passport using invisible ink. So when the visitors arrived at Baymard during check-in, they just had to give the code to the staff there, and he she would use a U.V light torch to check if it was correct. And apart from this code, there would be five other questions written in invisible ink as well. Those questions would be placed directly under the code. These questions were very common ones back one earth. What's your mother's maiden name? Where did you live when you were 10? In short, for identification purposes, personal questions like the ones above would be asked during every single visitor check-in. Even if they had once once stayed at Baymard months ago, if they were going in for the second time, they would be asked regardless. Also, out of all five questions written on the passport, those at the ports only had to randomly ask two of them. That was all. Anyway, when the visitors came to make their passports and their code had been jotted down, they had to pick out five questions out of 200 existing questions and give answers to them as well. And once everything was noted down, the workers would write out their information on a form and send it to the printing industry. There, their passport booklets would be completed and sent back to the office between four to eight days max. The orders were first, come first serve, no matter who had applied. Of course, before every visitor leaves the office, they would be told to come back 10 days later to pick up their new passport booklets, as well as return the tiny Visa I.D card that was given to them at the ports. For passport covers, Baymardians had red, colored passport covers. Those from treaty-signed empires had blue covers, and the rest just had green passport covers as well. As for the royals from both Baymard and all treaty-signed nations, their own passport covers would be gold. Yes, Baymardians had to have passports if they were going out. Like Landon had said, what if they were killed and someone was trying to impersonate them here? Though they had their I.D cards, those ones didn't go into detail like the passports. Hence, they had to get it no matter what. At any rate, with all these details and checks, Landon was hoping that no one would be able to sneak into Baymard so easily. Also, with these passports, the workers could also see how many times a person had applied or requested for a visa here. The passports would have 30 pages in total, hence it would last them for a while before they had to get completely new passports. The only thing that would change would be the amount of visas found within the passports. So when next they came, they wouldn't need to pay the fees for creating passports, just that for adding the visas onto their passports. The price for that was like 15 bays, so it wasn't really that expensive to do. Now apart from the whole visa thing, Baymard had also agreed to keep all dangerous prisoners from Corona within their maximum security prison at District B. 
District B had all protection academies like the military and police academy within Baymart. So for sure, this prison would be guarded heavily 24 hours every single day. Of course, the prison was very far from the main highways and was a little bit hidden from the public's eyes. Anyway, it's been almost half a year since construction for several prisons had begun. There were two types, ordinary crime types, which was at District C, just behind the police headquarters, and maximum security type, which was at District B. Of course, the ordinary crime type was completed a month ago, but the max security one still had a long way to go. From Landon's original plans, and even though it was still under construction, the completed sections of the prisons could still be used. So if dangerous prisoners were sent from Corona, Baymard would still be able to keep their end of the bargain as well. All in all, this deal would continue to remain feasible until Corona could protect itself, as well as have their own maximum security prison too. After all, Baymard couldn't carry Corona for a thousand years, now could it? In the future, once the entire Hurtphilia is treaty-bound, technology would definitely be allowed to spread. So by then, Corona could make their own damn prison. And at that point, this clause would immediately become void. But for now, Baymard was responsible for taking care of some of Corona's criminal baggage. Again, those few benefits weren't all that Corona was getting from this treaty. Education. No matter what academic facility it was, tuition was essential for its maintenance, teacher payout, and general upkeep of the facility. Generally, there were a lot of things that went into their student fees. Things like healthcare was a must for the students to have, especially the international ones, lest they fall ill and need treatment. And in addition to that, money was needed for several bills, be it paying for electrical bills, field trips, teaching services, items like lab equipments, chemicals, chairs, and so on. In short, all of these added to the cost of one's tuition per semester. In general, each class within Baymard's public school had children of various ages, preschool, ages 3 to 5, for each semester. Baymardians, 1,500 base. Treaty signed territories, 2,000 base. The rest, 2,500 base. One should know that each semester was four months, so it perfectly evened out for paying the teachers and so on. So each month, the Baymardians would have to save just 375 bays, copper coins, so as to pay out 1,500 bays. One could look at 375 bays as $375. Sure, it seemed ridiculously small to save up and pay tuitions, but in this era, it was just right. Elementary school, ages 5 to 11, from kindergarten, grade 1, all through grade 5. Baymardians, 1,800 base. Treaty signed territories, 2,650 base. The rest, 3,200 base. Junior high, ages 11 minus 15. From grade 6 all through grade 9. Baymardians, 2,200 base. Treaty signed territories, 3,000 bays. The rest, 3,800 bays. Of course, after this grade, they would graduate. And that was it. From this price list, it was clear to see that Corona was still getting a good deal compared to others. With respect to pricing, Landon would charge students according to what class group they were in and not their ages. For example, elementary school usually took in children from ages 5 to 11. But previously, there were students at 14 who didn't know how to write and were placed back at elementary school. So instead of charging them the price of a junior high student, 11 to 15, they would get charged as elementary students instead. But no matter what educational level they were at, at age 15, they were seen as adults. Hence it was graduation time. There was nothing Landon could do about it, as that was the coming of age period here. Of course as time went on, more and more people would get educated, as well as place their children in school at an early age. And by then, things would even out on their own. So Landon wasn't too worried about this. Also, the school also allowed to give out scholarships to the Baymardians, treaty sign nations, and the rest. These scholarships were there to encourage and reward those hardworking children. And apart from that, there were student programs that allowed minors from ages 9 to 14 to work. But they could only do very light jobs if they wanted to aid in paying off their fees with a monthly plan. One should know that apart from the nobles, 
peasants would also be attending this school as well in the nearest future. So giving them numerous opportunities for success was definitely a necessity. Actually, even back on Earth, children could work. However, the amount of time they put in and the amount of work that was meant to be carried out needed to be extremely light. For example, they could dog walk in the parks, help in gardening local areas, window cleaning, lemonade stand selling, and so on. Children also made money as well. Normally, an adult could work up to 8 to 10 hours a day. But for children, it would be advisable for them to use 4 to 5 hours max. Of course, even though this era was completely different from the one back on Earth, Landon had still chosen to stick to Earth's principles. But he knew that eventually, some children would grumble and ask for an increase in work time. After all, children here worked just like adults, at age 6 and even 7. Some of them were already serving at bars and restaurants for 8 hours straight, while others worked at stables for close to 10 hours without sleep. There were some who even worked by the seas and carried heavy boxes daily. Some also did babysitting, did house cleaning, and worked in the farms like pros. So 4 to 5 hours for them was like no work at all. But just because they could do it didn't mean that it was the right thing to do. Working like that at a young age would definitely affect them when they got older. Hence, five hours per day was the max that Landon could allow. For the work they could do, Landon had already thought a few. They could work as underage part-timers at the ranch. There, they would be given a special badge that showed their underage status, as well as other special work documents. And no matter what job they did, they would always have to do it under someone's supervision. Anyway, at the ranch, they could wash the horses, brush their hairs, feed them foods like apples, and even clean up their poop. Provided it wasn't tedious, Landon didn't see any reason why they couldn't do it. They could also work with Baymard's gardening company as well. There, they could help gather up fallen leaves, plant flowers, and even cut bushes from their clients' backyards or work areas. They could be posted at the park, other public areas, or even someone's private property. But of course, they would never be working alone as everything would always be under supervision. They could also work at the Baymard's cleaning company, where they would clean windows, mop hallways, sweep rooms, and so on. In essence, there were so many light jobs for them to do. So making money wasn't going to be an issue for these incoming international students. And just so that their schoolwork wasn't affected, they were only allowed to work on weekends. Again, if they couldn't pay up all their fees at the end of the semester. Then they could apply for an extension payment plan and work during all holidays here. Generally, Landon wouldn't allow international students to stay within Baymar during the long holidays. But if they still owed the school and wanted to work for their pay, then by all means, they could go right ahead and do so. With this, Landon decided to change his initial stance on having students stay in Baymar during the holidays. Now, he would allow them to stay, but they had to apply for a stay before doing so. Regardless, if they decided to stay, their maximum work hours during holidays like would be 25 hours a week, 5 hours times 5 days. Tackling student visas, it wasn't logical to have students change visas every 3 months, since they would essentially come back and study till they graduated. But even so, Landon couldn't give them anything that went over a year. Hence, he had decided that their visas would last for one year max, and if they wanted to renew it again, they just had to prove that they had registered for next year's semester. And that would be all. What if he gave some people five-year visas and then didn't bother to show up again? Or worse, their visas got stolen? Everything Landon was doing was trying to reduce identity theft to a minimal scale, compared to other empires that allowed all assassins, crooks, and thieves to sneak or bribe their way into larger cities just like that. Landon was trying his best to make this place a safe haven for his people. Hence, all these checks were damn important in stopping criminals from getting in. Sure, some would definitely get in, but the numbers had to be few. Moving on, one year was a lot compared to ordinary visitor entries. Hence, be it international culinary students or public school international students, they would have specific passport covers as well. All treaty-signed international students would have gray passport covers, and the other international students would have dark brown colored passport covers. The reason why Landon truly wanted to differentiate everything was so that those who worked at the port would have an easy time identifying different persons. 
If one saw someone with a blue passport, they would know that this was a citizen from a treaty-signed territory. Likewise, if they saw other Baymardians or even students, they would automatically know as well. Of course, Baymardian students didn't need special passports, as their red-colored ones were more than enough to carry them through. After all, all Baymard citizens would be able to keep the same passport for 10 years, before it would finally expire. With all that said, as per the treaty, Baymard had given educational discounts to Coronians if they decided to study here. Ha 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 ha. Good. 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 Kid, you're really the best. Carmelo said, while patting Landon's shoulders happily. Carmelo was in such a good mood, that even if someone punched him for no reason, he was sure that he would turn the other cheek at them. Why didn't the heavens allow Landon to be born sooner? Bloody hell. If he met Landon when he was in his teens, do you know how much they would have changed by now? He could only curse his luck for being born too early. Truly, life wasn't fair at all. Landon looked at Carmelo helplessly. Isn't it too early to get excited? I've told you that only when Queen Penelope signs as well, will this transaction be officially completed. And besides, what if she doesn't agree to these conditions? Nonsense. How could she not agree? A hangul can only give birth to a hangul. So we definitely think alike. Presently, the treaty was placed in ring binders. Because one person's signature was still needed. But when Penelope added her own, Landon would join all the single pages from the ring binder. And create a book with them. For documents as important as this, it was important for it to be properly binded. With hard book covers and so on. In fact, it had to be binded like how Parliament books and even Vatican Bibles were created. But he couldn't do this yet, until all signatures were present. The system had required for both Santa and Penelope to sign this treaty. Hence he needed her signature goddammit. How the system knew that Santa had gotten together with Penelope was beyond his imagination. Was this what it meant to be all powerful beings? Did they also watch Santa as well? Anyway, for the signature part, he wasn't worried at all, as he had learnt that Santa alone would be leaving in three days' time. Penelope had given Santa a time frame to be back, so he had to leave SAP. Hence, he would send the treaty to Penelope using Santa. Kid, leaving that matter alone. Are you sure that Baymard can operate a transport route for the citizens of Corona? It would be great if it could happen, but wouldn't that be too much for you all to handle? Baron Hamilton asked curiously. This feat alone would be difficult for Corona to do. So Hamilton was somewhat inquisitive about how Landon would magically accomplish such a task. Landon smiled and shook his head. Really, it's nothing at all. Our ships would be ready by next year's winter season. So we'll officially start during spring. Specifically May. Landon replied. In truth, it was the system that had placed it in the treaty. So Landon had no choice but to go along with it too. In essence, the system wanted him to form a water transport route from Baymard to Corona. For this, Landon already had a well-detailed plan in mind. Firstly, he needed at least eight transport ships to be built before spring next year. Of course, construction of such ship types were already in progress and would definitely be done before then. Anyway, as for ship schedules, Landon had to adjust them according to the ships. Now, one had to know that ships in this era had hundreds of people below deck who were constantly rowing their lives away all through their journey. Of course, sometimes, if the currents were pushing the ships towards their destination, then they would stop rowing and the captains would continue to stir the ships instead. Typically, using these ships took the passengers a month's time to travel from Baymard to Corona. But now, things were a little bit different. Back in the days, sailing across the Atlantic could take sailors at least nine months to a year to accomplish. But with the invention of motorized engines, people could sail in cruises, as well as transport bananas and other food items within three weeks to two months' time. Now picture that for a place that only needed a month journey by using old-fashioned sailing ships. Again, one could cruise from Hamburg, Germany, to New York within 15 days. But old sailing ships could have done that in six to seven months' time. Hence for a place that only needed one to sail for a month. Landon had estimated that at most two days would do for the schedule. In truth, with motorized engines, they could arrive within a day's time. But Landon added another day 
just in case any foreseen incidents occurred. For the schedules, Landon had decided that ships would arrive in Corona on Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and on Tuesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. The ships would leave instead. Of course, the vice versa of these schedules would be planned for Baymart as well. These eight ships would be going back and forth on the water route. Hence, they needed protection of their own. That's why they would have guards on them, as well as missile and cannon launching systems on them. So for how the citizens could register for these trips from Corona, Landon had planned to let Santa set up an office there. Of course, he had decided to use only one coastal shore within Corona. And that was the one that had one of Santa's largest estates on it. If anybody wanted to ride on these cruisers, then they would have to come to that coastal city and do so. There, they could register or book their sleeping cabinets for their journey. To make bookings easier on the staff, Landon would give a layout of these sleeping cabinets, ranging from economy to first class. In this way, the workers would know whether sleeping cabinets were available or not at all times. All in all, next year May, the Baymard Corona Transport System would be officially open for business. Amazing! I truly want to see if a ship could actually travel that distance in such a short period of time. Kid, book the first ticket for me when the time comes. Backslash, Baron Hamilton said excitedly. Me too, Santa added. As a merchant, how could he not want such a ship? But he knew that this brother of his wouldn't bulge any time soon. So he could only cry out silently and try the ship out for himself when the time came. Brat. I'm more interested in this United Nations thing. So you're saying that we will join in after the treaty gets signed? Adrian asked. Yup, that's how it'll be. For now, it's just Baymard and Corona. But in future, I plan to unite the entire Pino continent as well. Within the treaty, they had also spoken about forming AU.in here in Hertfilia. And yes, it would have the same format as the one back on Earth. It would have a board, with parliament members and so on. It would exist to aid other nations in times of need, like an outbreak of plagues, national disasters and so on, as well as aid empires who were struggling to rise as well. Of course, this board could never be used for stealing people's territories, taking slaves and so on. It was here for peace and unity, as well as to fight corruption and things that stood against human rights. Kid, not bad. Bro, I like the way you think. Brat. Can't you be more like him? Baron Hamilton said, while playfully hitting Santa's head. As they conversed, the system's notification immediately rang out in Landon's mind. Host, you have three new missions. Landon was surprised. He wasn't even done with this one yet. But this slave running system still gave him more tasks to do heartlessly. I mean, was this how systems usually operated? Why did it feel like his own system hated him to the core? Other systems would remind their hosts about their pending tasks and look out for them. But no, his own system would look down from the heavens and chew popcorn while watching his life like a movie. His system could go into silent mode for several months and only ever spoke to him when he needed something or if there was a new task at hand. For example, if only five days were left before a task needed to be completed, and Landon hadn't done so, the system wouldn't even bother to remind him at all. After all, it wasn't the system's soul that would be obliterated. So why should it worry about him? Landon felt like calling customer service every time he was faced with the system's spicy attitude. Who knows? Maybe after going through 200 or more worlds together, their relationship would finally improve. Very quickly, Landon went to check out these so could be missions. Side mission 2. Task. Assimilate at least 60% of Nopline's forces into the host's own forces. Rewards, 250 bonus points, 1200 technology points, and 650 development points. Deadline. 18 months, 1 year and 6 months. Side mission 3. Task. Use your new medical and surgical rewards to treat King Adrian's appendicitis. Rewards, 80 BP, 300 TP, and 190 DP. Deadline, August 25th, seven days from now. Side mission four. Task, help the ghostly prince become king of Arcadina and sign a treaty with him. Rewards, 130 BP, 800 TP, and 350 DP. Deadline, three years. Landon looked at these side missions, and instantly, 
his mind went to work. Treating Adrian was something he could definitely, but assimilating 60% of Nopline's army was a little too much. Sigh. What choice did he have? System. Aren't you going to give me any information on where his warrior slaves, troops, and other soldiers are? If Host wants them, then Host will have to buy it from the system. The system is only here to tell you what your mission is, and nothing else. Landon felt like crying. He knew it. This system was too black-bellied. For sure, it wanted him to buy maps and info from it. Forget it. He might as well give up on asking for customer service. He had a grumpy system, and that was that. After buying several maps from the system, he realized that Nopline had nine bases in Terike, five in Arcadina, seven in Deiphorus, four in Yoden, and three in Corona. Of course, those training estates in Corona were non-existent, as Landon had taken the warriors there, as well as destroyed the estate itself. Apart from that, Landon had also bought maps that showed underground slave camps all over the Pino continent. This kind of mission. Was the system trying to kill him? Looking at the maps, he decided that now would be the best time to strike. Thinking about it now, even if Santa took goods back, it would be a while before news left Corona and traveled to the ends of the Pino continent. Information could took months and months to properly circulate around before getting to the ears of most powerful people. Like Landon had said, even if it reached the shores, traveling to the capital city was a different matter on its own. So right now, no one really knew about them. And even if they found out about Baymard's growth, they still wouldn't know about its military prowess yet. Hence with all these analyses, striking earlier was the best mode of action. Well, he could only strike Arcadina for the time being, as he had to wait for the treaty to be brought back first. So he couldn't afford to go too far from Baymard for the time being. For these missions, Landon had decided that most of the traveling would be done by ship, Looking at the estates scattered around Arcadina, Landon had realized that Nopline had placed his camps within cities that weren't too far from the ocean. This was probably so that if he needed backup, they could quickly get on ships and come to his aid. Don't get it twisted. Some of these cities would take one two weeks to a month from their base to the shores, but it was still close, compared to placing them in regions that required one to travel for three to four months before reaching the shores. Also, Traveling by ship was for sure the best, as traveling by horse towards some of these destinations would take Landon six to seven months to do. Hence, it was better to sail around the perimeter of Arcadina and drop off at the nearest coastal city. Landon sighed and massaged his temples. It looked like I'll have to set sail again soon, but his mind couldn't help but wonder about his final side mission. The system had asked him to help someone sit on the throne, as well as sign a treaty with him, but in all honesty, Landon had no idea who the guy was. After searching through his memory, he still had no clue about the guy. Who the hell was this ghostly prince dude? System, can you give me his whereabouts? Host shouldn't worry, as the threads of fate have woven both of you together. He will find you on his own host. Landon looked up towards the ceiling and felt like strangling the system. What bullshit strings of fate? Why make his work harder? He had no picture or memory of this dude. Supposed to know when the time came? TSK. He couldn't wait to reach the level where he would be able to know more and see these so-called gods. By then, he would take a heavenly chainsaw and run it through their bodies. Strings of fate my ass. Secret base, somewhere around the northwestern part of Arcadina. The night sky was filled with stars that shone as bright as a diamond. And glistening brightly, across the sky's dark canvas. It came alive as the sparkly dots twinkled shyly, as they stared back at Hurtfilia, standing on a balcony, was a lone man, who seemed deep in thought. He had been moving from one base to another, while carrying out numerous missions within Arcadina. Top, top, top. Very quickly, he could hear footsteps making his way towards him. Young master, I just received some interesting news from our men at Riverdale City. It seems that during the month of May, Something strange occurred within the western region. A thirty-something-year-old knight said, Oh, young master, it concerns one of your cousins. It's about the famous bastard, Landon Barn. Young master, it was reported that a group of soldiers, at least a thousand in number, had made their way to conquer Baymard within the month of May. The young knight said, Any report about the men leaving Baymard? 
No young master. It would seem that they had succeeded in conquering Baymart. William tapped his fingers on the balcony for a while, before sighing out in pity. Sigh. It seems like that this cousin of mine was either forced into slavery, or worse, killed. He's a pitiful one, young master. Indeed. Send a message for our men in Riverdale City to find out about his situation detaily. If he died, then they should step back. But if he survived, then have them rescue him immediately. But young master, what do we do after rescuing him? Give him 30,000 copper coins and have him leave Arcadina. This place is too dangerous for him. So it's best for him to go instead. Yes, young master. William looked up to the sky and continued sighing. He had heard about this cousin of his and had also seen him while in disguise two years ago. Funny enough, he had spoken to Landon for close to a month while pretending to be a fireplace boy. Normally, palaces often had over 700 people working within them. Palaces required dozens of servants just to maintain the day-to-day -day workings of the place. The servants were meant to take care of the royals, as well as the thousands of knights living within the palace. Some were poop boys who threw out buckets of shit daily. Others took care of the horses, fetched clean water, polished armor, and so on. And one shouldn't forget that each noble woman within the palace had more than 30, 50 maids assigned to their individual courtyards. It was like living in a tiny cramped city, with everyone all serving the needs of a single family. So of course the palace would have over 700 people in it. As for how the living quarters for the servants were, one could say that seven to ten people would sometimes cramp into a single room each night. Only favored maids, butlers, and slaves could sleep in groups of two or four. In short, they were treated like shit. Anyway, with so many fireplace boys around, William had easily sneaked into the palace using that identity. Of course, no one had discovered him because of all the cinders on his face. Fireplace boys could work in the kitchens and any other areas with fireplaces. Hence they usually took care of the charcoal and swept all the cinders out. So their faces were always as black as those chimney sweepers in Mary Poppins. Hence when he walked around the palace, he would always leave his face like so. Back then, William had immediately realized that this cousin of his wasn't built for war. Everyone bullied him and talked badly about him. Heck, even the maids treated him like garbage. No matter how he looked at it, there was no way that Landon and his army of 300 would win against thousands of knights. If you do survive, I will do everything in my power to give you a peaceful life. William thought. Young master, there was also news from the east. It seems like that Slytherin cord guy is secretly heading towards one of Eli Barnes' camps with more than 7,000 knights. So far, we haven't figured out why they're moving such large forces yet. Backslash. Oh? It looks like something big will happen soon. Unknown forest, Arcadina. Under the clear moonless night, the stars illuminated Hurtphilia, giving off a light dim glow to the land below. The night seemed magical, as several fireflies danced in a heady swarm of light, like a frozen firework explosion. Gallop, gallop, gallop. Eleven men on horseback were currently riding within the forest trails in the dead of night. We will stop here commanded one of the men. All this while, they had been looking for somewhere safe to camp. They had to choose a place that wasn't too easy for enemies to spot, as well as not too close to the deep jungle-like forest, lest they get attacked by wild animals as well. And after searching for close to 50 minutes, they had finally found the perfect location. After setting their camp and preparing dinner, they immediately gathered around the fireside to begin their feast. Connor dug into his meat and felt like crying. One should know that for the past two weeks, they had been eating raw mice and other digesting food stuff. At this point, if food was a god, he would worship and pray earnestly at its temple daily. All hail the god of food. In fact, it wasn't just him, but everyone else as well. After eating soaked bread for weeks, one could imagine how tear-jerking eating this roasted meat was. As the thought of Mr. Death, their faces immediately became distorted from anger. These past two weeks had been the worst time of their lives. All of them had come out with at least two or three permanent injuries on them, from loosing their arms, toes, and so on. Everyone had lost their body parts to these games. 
They had gone into that estate in groups of thousands, but at the end, only eleven of them from Connor's side had survived. As for James' side, only four people had made it out, James included. No matter how they wrapped their heads around it, they couldn't see how that waste had managed to survive. But little did they know that Mr. Death's employer had specifically instructed that both James and Connor had to survive. They could lose small body parts like toes, fingers, and ears, but not major like an entire leg or arm. Even if they were about to make the wrong moves, Mr. Death's people would make sure that they were done, as per his employer's request. So even if they chose the option of loosing an arm, Mr. Death's people would switch it to any measly body part. Your Highness, it was definitely Prince Eli who did this. One of the yelled exclaimed in anger as he thought about the whole situation again. I agree, your highness. Mr. Death said that his employer was a royal, so I can only see it being Prince Eli. No, your highness. I think it was the first queen's scheme. Eli's mother? Your highness. Your highness. Your. As the men spoke out in turns, Connor quietly listened to their suggestions on the matter. No matter how he looked at it, the person who hired Mr. Death was merely playing with them. This move showed that whether they died or not, Mr. Death's employer couldn't be bothered by them. I essence, they were telling them that no matter how much they did, it would never obstruct the employer's plans. Hence in this game of cat and mouse, they were just ants, who could be squashed any time they wanted. Connor closed his eyes in fury. He was sure that this plot came from Eli. That brother of his had always seemed to know everything. No matter how many assassins or attacks one sent to him, Eli would always come out unscathed. For the fact that Eli still kept them alive, just how little he thought of them. Eli was basically telling them that they could jump up and down like fleas. But at the end of the day, the throne would still belong to him. How hateful. Right now, he just wanted to get home fast. So that he could strategically plan his revenge. Eli had to die for his fury to completely quench down. Bastard. Baymard. It was a fine day. The air was warm, and the sky was blue. It was the perfect beach weather, as it signified summer's vibrant splendor. Today, Baymard seemed to be in a complete uproar. The streets had been filled with people running up and down in a frenzy, as they tried to get to the nearest stores. OMG. It was launching today. The people quickly stormed the stores, as they were hurrying to get these goods before they finally sold out. Indeed, this wild crowd had a mind of its own. Like swarming bees, the people hustled and bustled as they bumped into each other here and there. Some accidentally stepped on others' toes, while others had been lined outside stores for several minutes now. And what did they want to get? What was so damn important for them to run around like mad people? One word. Radios. Well, radio communicative devices already existed in Baymart, but they were only used by the Baymart security forces. Hence civilians didn't have access to them. Radio frequency gadgets like walkie-talkies were already used by the army, police, security guards, and so on. As well as radio communications within official cars like police cars. Bottom line, only protective forces used them. But today, Baymard was officially launching its first radio which would have channels and stations on them. Now, ever since Landon had come back from that mission in June, he had been training some of the slaves to be on-air radio personals. They had been training for two months now, and Landon felt like they were now truly ready. One shouldn't forget that the radio station and towers had already been constructed way back. In fact, Landon would have launched these radios in spring. But with the mission at hand, he chose to launch it today. As for the radio stations, for now, there would only be five stations, which offered numerous talks on them. And since Baymard had the same first letter as Britain, then instead of British Broadcasting Corporation, Landon had switched it to Baymardian Broadcasting Corporation. In short, it was still the BBC. Did he steal it from Earth? Yup. Was he sorry about doing so? Nope. It was too iconic, and quite frankly, very easy going on the eyes, or should he say tongue? As for these stations, their names were like so. 1. BBC Radio 1 88 to 91 FM, local news, international news, provided by Landon or spies. Of course, that also includes war, policies, territories that sign treaties with Baymard, rules, and so on. 2. BBC Radio 2, 
90-93 FM, Sports, Adult-Oriented Topics, with podcasts on love, Valentine's Day, happiness, and so on. 3. BBC Radio 3, 91-99 FM, Everything Beauty, from How to Take Care of Skin, Teeth, and so on. Of course, this station would definitely become popular with the ladies. Medical Health and Safety, and podcasts from some doctors that educate people on what they're doing wrong and so on. 4. BBC Radio 4, 92-95 FM. Businesses, like job opportunities, important concerts available, news on when public attractions like the zoo get competed, and so on. Important newspaper info would also be added to these segments. 5. BBC Station 5, 97-99 FM. Historical, drama, fantasy, sci-fi, and comedic children's story times. Here, children could listen to new stories any time of the day. Anyway, these were Baymard's current stations. And within each individual station, certain time frames would be dedicated for each segment. Take for example BBC Radio 5, which had five children's genres in total. From comedic stories from 9 to 9.45 a.m., dramatical stories 10 to 10.45 a.m., historical stories 11 to 11.45 a.m., sci-fi or sciency 1 to 1.45 p.m., fantasy stories 2 to 2.45 p.m., and since these stations would close by 9 p.m., then the exact stories would be repeated on that same order from 3 to 8.45 p.m. One should know that Baymar didn't have any recording or playback devices right now. Hence, they had no choice but to repeat again the same things again and again. In doing so, those children who missed it due to school and so on could listen to them again later in the day. The same went for the workers who would miss news, sports, and so on. In short, these radio stations had to cater for everyone's needs. Within the busy stores, the people squeezed and pushed their way in as if they were in some sort of fight club. And in a blink of an eye, these radios had almost sold out. Right now, in one of the stores, only four radios remained. Done. Done. All the customers who had just managed to get in quickly made their way towards the shelves. As soon as they neared the shelves, their eyes immediately turned into predator mode. The scene immediately turned into a battlefield for them. One of the customers ran as fast as he could, but when he was closing in on the shelf, someone literally dived on top of him, pushed him down, and rolled away. He looked up and realized that it was a woman. She was definitely cheating. She looked back at him and smirked, as if saying, who told you not to use these moves? Unfortunately for her, in that split second when she looked back, someone else ran with a cart and literally hit her from her side with it, accidentally allowing her to fall into the cart. From there, the man pushed the cart towards the crowd behind him. As if trying to buy himself more time, the woman glared at him hatefully. Can't you see that I'm a woman? Woman shwumum. This is equality. Very different from the chaotic scenes within the stores. Those who had just gotten their own radios were excitedly listening to the news in amazement. Santa and his gang were amongst them as well. One had to know that they had gone undercover in disguise just to get their own as well. And just from this experience, they had soon realized that they weren't above battling for them as well. Damn, they had done all sorts of crazy stunts just to get their radios as well. Was it crawling on the floors? They had done that. Jumping over people? Why do you still need to ask? At first they wanted to be civilized. But when they saw how crazy the crowd was, they quickly threw those idiotic thoughts out of the way. F asterisk CK it. It was now or never. They entered the jungle and managed to come out victorious. With little claw marks here and there of course. After reading the instructions that came with the radio, Carmelo plugged in the radio and quickly pressed the tiny red on the device. Wait. Turn it to FM 88 to 91. I think that's the BBC station one. Adrian said excitedly. Carmelo turned the large extended disc on the device until he got to the first station and very quickly they could hear someone's voice coming from the device. In other local news, Baymard's first car show would take place five days from now. We have all been taking our driving exams since last year and now everyone would get the chance to own their own cars. As for what this car show is, well, you'll just have to see, won't you? I'm Karen Wimblow. And this is the BBC radio station one. 
We'll take a short 15 minutes break now, and when we resume, we'll talk about the latest political development in Arcadena, as well as that from the Empire of Terry K. So stay tuned with us, because later on, we will be looking at international news. As they listened on, everyone's eyes almost dropped out of their sockets. This is amazing. Just how does that brat keep doing it? Mummy, mummy, is there a person inside this tiny metal radio? I, I don't know. After a while, they switched to other stations and were thoroughly drawn in by what they were hearing. The women wanted to know how to prevent wrinkles, but the men wanted to either switch back to sports, business, or news. As for the children, they had gotten a glimpse of these stories and had wanted to keep the channel there. Looking at the radio, they couldn't help but feel like crying. They had fought their way in and had only managed to get one radio. Now everyone was fighting for it. The only question they had right now was when the next set of radios would be placed back in stores. Are you looking to die? Keep it at Station 3. Let me die. We'll leave it at Station 2. Pui, what do you all know? It'll stay at Station 1. Didn't you hear that international news would soon start? And so what? I want to know about my beauty regimen. Station 5. Station 4. And just like that, Radio madness had quickly swept over the entire Baymard like a storm. Ah, technology. So none of you are willing to go back with me? Three days had gone by just like that. And today, Santa was finally leaving Baymard. But since he would be coming again once Penelope signed the treaty, everyone chose to go later on, and not right now. And since they were allowed to work, they immediately started thinking of going job hunting and so on. Sure, they were royals. But ever since they had stepped in here, they had seen other royals work as well. Mother Kim was a teacher, and even King Landon worked at the hospital in every other place one could imagine. Yesterday when they looked at the newspaper, they saw several job ads in them. One should know that at the end of every semester, students graduated and started looking for jobs. Hence there were always people trying to get into the job market. Even those who were on holidays still needed summer jobs. Hence the newspapers were always filled with several jobs offered daily. Of course, some jobs like junior electricians, or any job that was deeply rooted with Baymard secrets, were completely unavailable to non-Baymardians. On the newspapers, it would say things like, must be a citizen of Baymard, and so on. Yesterday, they had spent their entire time preparing for some job interviews. They had read articles on the newspaper about prepping for jobs as well as what they should bring to these interviews. The whole thing seemed so fascinating, especially to the women. One had to know that all they did all day was sit at home, make sure that the maids had prepared their husband and children's meals, run the household, and so on. They actually never touched anything, so this was a whole new experience for them. As for the men, they couldn't leave as well. As four days from now, they would begin a test trial on how Baymard was going to train their knights. They would train until Santa came back. And apart from that, they were also allowed to take up part-time jobs if they wanted to. Staying in Baymard for months would definitely run their money dry, whether they were nobles or not. Hence getting a job was definitely for the best. In respect to the children, they were all starting school in two days' time. So of course they would stay as well. Yes, Duchess Mina and Duke Samula had decided to allow their children stay in Baymard and study for both semesters. And in summer, they would come back to Corona as well. One had to look at the bigger picture here. If they could get educated, then when they graduated, they could help in making changes within Corona. After all, like Landon had said, the future were the youths. And so as to keep their son's sword fighting skills intact, they had decided to leave four of their most trusted guards with them while they stayed. One had to know that night pages trained almost every day. Hence they needed the guards to keep their sons on their toes. At least once a day, their sons should practice fiercely for an entire hour, or more. As for their daughters, they were more than pleased to elevate them, as they felt like the courses offered here were way better than what was offered at Corona. So far, their daughters had taken etiquette classes, poetry, reading and writing classes, as well as simple math classes, addition and subtraction. But when they saw Linda and all the other children here, they were completely stunned by how intellectually smart they all were. Anyway, today was August 10th, and school had already resumed on the 3rd of the month. But even still, Landon had assured them that it wasn't too late for the children to join in the semester. 
Presently, they had all signed up for Math 1. Addition and Subtraction Math 2. Division and Multiplication Pyron 1. Nouns, Adjectives, Reading, Writing, etc. Of course those were just their main courses. As they had other courses like Arts and Craft, History, Poetry, Gym, and so on. So one could say that these children would have their hands full for the rest of the semester. Bottom line, Santa was leaving with half of the royal guards. And everyone else was staying here until the treaty was brought back. Looking at the goods that he had stocked up on his ship, Santa couldn't help but smile a bit. For this first round, he had only chosen things that were a necessity for his people. Things like mattresses, beddings, books, pins, winter jackets, and so on were his first line of action. Before leaving, he had spoken to Landon about the price. Landon wanted these items to be accessible to even peasants, so there was no way that he would allow anyone to sell them at a ridiculously price. Hence he came up with a price range for various areas, based on the exportation tax fees and so on. For example, if 12 pencils cost 3 copper coins, then Corona could sell it between 3 to 8 copper coins per pack. Landon had added shipping rate, exportation tax, middleman fees, and so on, to the that initial price. But since Santa would usually buy in bulk slash wholesale, the price should automatically become cheaper when compared to shipping individually. At the end, he had cost down on a lot of fees. Time passed by swiftly, and once everything was finally packed, Santa came back to say goodbye to everyone. Woo, bro, they're so mean. Can't they at least pretend to miss me a little? Santa said while hugging Landon and pouting like a little kid. Landon shook his head and smiled awkwardly. This guy was truly shameless. Everyone felt a headache coming along as they looked at the giant-sized child before them. The children smacked their hands at their foreheads as they too felt like this guy way too childish. Even for them. And they should know, they were the ones who were kids. Erm, uncle, you know we'll miss you, right? So stop crying, replied one of the children. Yeah, uncle. We'll miss you for sure. Uncle, haven't I told you that you're the best in the whole wide hurt philia? The children tried to coax this baby-like uncle of theirs until they saw signs of his mood, cheering up. Santa raised his head and looked at them sadly, with a poppy dog look on his face. Really? You'll miss me? Santa asked pitifully. For sure, uncle. They replied. Okay. Since you'll all miss me too much, then come back with me. Uncle, please get on the ship. Farewell, uncle. Goodbye. Only a day had passed since Santa's dramatic exit from Baymart. The dude was crying and waving a blue handkerchief towards them as he set sail into open waters. What a strange guy. Today, Landon had decided to start prepping for his missions ASAP. First, he wanted to see Lucius and plan out his attacks on those camps. And after that, he had a hospital appointment with Adrian. He had to treat Adrian's appendicitis. Landon quickly made his way towards the police headquarters and into Lucius' office. Yes, Lucius was also the chief of police of the whole station, so one could imagine how busy the dude was. After speaking for a while, Lucius had gotten the full gist about these missions. Hum, I think it's a good idea. It'll be good for giving the men more field experience. And if we do succeed then we'll be able to add our military forces by a massive fold. Lucius said, while looking at all the maps, from how detailed they were, he could see that the training estates were all in the same cities as the underground slave camps. This was perfect. In truth, Landon had planned to stop taking in more slaves. But since these training camps were literally within the same cities as the slave camps, Landon felt like it would be cruel to leave those slaves behind. And from his last mission, he had gotten to know that most of these slaves, as well as trained night slaves, had their families within both camps. So in the end, he was sure that he would have to rescue them either way. Well, with more slaves, there would be more laborers to work at all the upcoming projects that he had in mind. Some jobs needed him to hire hundreds of people on the spot, and almost everyone in Baymard had fixed jobs, except for the graduates. So more manpower would always be a beneficial. For example, if he wanted to start running an amusement park from scratch, hands down, he would need to hire at least 800 people on the spot for both working shifts. They would be needed to check all the equipments daily and hourly, run the park and so on. 
So where was he supposed to get so many at once, when most people already had fixed jobs? New industrial ideas require a lot of people. These were Baymard's early development stages. Hence, they needed all the help that they could get. And with more treaties signed, that would mean that more empires, countries, and continents would want their goods. So in essence, Baymard would be supplying worldwide at a fast rate. Hence, laborers would always be needed. But even if the entire world balanced off technologically, jobs would always be created, as new ideas from youths and so on would be invented as well. So for the matter of taking in new slaves, Landon was going to say hell yeah to that. As for Lucius, his mind was literally glued at the possibility of doubling Baymard's protective forces. One had to know that even if graduates apply, it wouldn't really add up when compared with the number gotten from missions. For example, by the end of last semester, only 112 graduates applied to join the army. But when Landon came back from those missions, he had brought back more than 7,000 potential soldiers with him. Forget it. This mission was definitely an opportunity to strengthen the army, police force, security guards, marines, coast guards, and all other forces. So of course it was a great idea. From the overall map, even though there are five camps residing within Arcadena, we can easily reach them through these three coastal cities here. Landon said, while drawing circles onto the map. As they conversed, they began assessing their all regions around each camp. Looking at the map, one could see that these camps had been strategically positioned like tuning forks. Picturing a tuning fork, the handle end is where the coastal shores are, and each shore leads to two camps. Well, from the first coastal city, one would ride on horseback for two and a half weeks before choosing to continue on straight, right path, or choosing the left road path. If one continued on the right path, after three more cities and two towns, they would finally reach the city with the first training estate within it. But if they choose to follow the left road, then they would also pass four more cities, one town, and one village, before they could reach the second training camp. And all this was if they got off at the first coastal city that Landon had selected. From the map, the first coastal city and second city selected, all led to the training camps in the same manner. Hence these two coastal cities would definitely lead them to four of the camps. As for the last one, it was just direct, with no form of disguise to it. What do you think? Hum. Compared to the other coastal cities around Arcadena's shores, those ones are indeed the closest to our targets. So what's the plan from there? Will you do these operations together? Or will you all split up? Lucius asked curiously, as he continued to observe the map. Looking at it clearly, going together in a group could take more than seven months to complete these missions altogether. So splitting up would be best. We'll split up. And since there are five camps, there would also be five main leaders as well. So for this mission, my team and I will conquer one camp, and the soldiers will handle the rest. Now, two coastal cities have four camps, so we'll send the men out in pairs. I see where you're going with this. This way, they could help each other if need be. Exactly. Since they're paired, two teams and sail together towards one coastal city. From there, they would follow the trail of the fork on the road. And later, one team would split to the left and the other to the right. And even if one team finishes their mission early, they still had to wait on their ships for the other team no matter what. Backslash? Ah. Uh, that way, if they waited for too long, they could simply scout the region to find out what was going on. And if rescue was needed, then they would know how to proceed from there. That's the plan. Oh, and I'm guessing you'll be heading towards the last coastal city, right? Yup. After all, it's the closest to Baymard's shores, and I need to be here before Santa gets back, Landon said. In essence, it would take a month for the men to sail towards the first coastal region around Baymard's shores, which was basically Arcadena's northern zone. Arcadena was three times larger than Corona. So, of course, just moving across it took a massive amount of time. Looking at the second camp, which was located at the within Arcadena's northwestern territory, it would take the men three weeks to sail there. And for the third camp, which was actually within the Arcadena's western perimeter, one could literally reach there in a week's time from Baymard shores. Hence Landon had chosen to deal with this third camp. With how much time it took for one to arrive at these camps, it was obviously better for them to split up and do the work more effectively. For example, looking at the first camp, 
One would have to sail for a month, ride on horseback for two and a half weeks, attack, conquer, and then head back towards Baymart. Bottom line, one would spend at least three months out there if they wanted to head on towards the first coastal shores. One had to know that Landon also had to conquer the camps within the empires as well. So if he was to personally do everything himself, time would definitely run out for him. After all, the system had given him a deadline, and failure to do so would lead to his death. As for the ships that they would use for these missions, it would be those same ones that they had used to head back to Baymard from their last mission. Also those crewmen who come with them had been training Baymard sailors on how to use these old-fashioned boats. Hence Landon didn't really have to worry about anything at the moment, since for this trip, he would be taking those crewmen, as well as the newly trained ones. The question now is, when are you leaving? I think a week from now will do. Hum, not bad, you need to prepare for this one. After all, some of the men would be away for three months. But not to worry, I'll have everything prepared immediately. They spoke for a while more, before finally concluding everything for this upcoming mission. Brat. I'm busy now so run along. Lucius teased. Old man, who the hell wanted to stay here with you? I'll have you know that I have a very important appointment to catch. Hum? Where? At the hospital. Landon looked at his watch and realized that he had time before Adrian's operation. His appointment was at 4 p.m., but it was currently just 11.15 a.m. Well, that was good. He had planned to meet the government officials sometime within this week. So he might as well do it now. Nicholas, how are the stats looking? Landon asked, while looking through the report before him. Your Majesty, as of July 31st, 1025, Baymard's overall population was calculated to be 97, 863. And of course, we had also taken into account the newly born babies within the month, and the few elderly deaths as well, Nicholas said excitedly. Ever since he had been using this chart system, Everything else seemed to be fairly easy to talk about. He had never used this pie chart or table thing, as he was used to writing everything in paragraphs. But His Majesty hated that. His Majesty just wanted tables or pie charts for numbers, as well as straight-to-the-point bullet points besides them. Of course, he still needed to write detailed reports and properly store them away as well. But when presenting to His Majesty, it was all done in simple formats as he found that he could easily remember and see which areas needed more attention if they were on charts or tables rather than paragraphs. Be it how much food Baymard consumed or how much supplies they needed, everything was just simple to see in chart form and even in table form. Looking at the total population, Landon was thoroughly pleased with the analysis. One had to know that from May of last year to July of this year, Landon had been bringing in at least 5,000 slaves into Baymard monthly. And even when he went out for this mission, he had still managed to bring over 17,000 people back with him. Coupled with the growing birth rate in Baymard, the population had quickly skyrocketed from its measly 1,500. Now, they were a massive 97, 000. But of course, like most cities that had large land spaces that could host over millions, like Tokyo or Toronto, Baymard had the same capability as well. In essence, Thousands of years from now, Baymard could also make room for more than 7 million people as well. So this 97,000 was still nothing to the city's housing capacity. Landon stayed for a while and spoke about more policies with Nicholas, as well as what he wanted improved during his upcoming absence. And an hour later, he decided to head towards the lower region. He had a lot of plans to put in motion, so time was of the essence. The construction industry, stepping into the industry, Landon couldn't help but smile a little. 70% of the buildings had been renovated, while the rest were still currently under renovation. Those buildings had pipe water supply, heating, lighting, and sewage functions. And most of their building structures had also been changed as well. In short, it was truly an upgrade. When comparing it to those good old days, Welcome your majesty, Tim said while rushing towards Landon. In truth, he had been aiding the construction workers to work on the other buildings that needed renovating. So he had seen Landon come in a while ago. So he quickly hot out of one of the heavy machines, washed up his hands, and ran towards Landon. Ah, Tim, just the guy I was looking for. Hee <laughs> hee. I remember that renovations on your office building was just completed a few days ago. 
So how's the change? Eh, your majesty, you still need to ask? Of course it was great. Best feeling ever. Tim exclaimed happily. One said no that even though he had previously had those essential utilities at home, he still spent half of his day at work. So when the place wasn't renovated yet, he had always felt like crying, as even taking a dump was a problem with no indoor plumbing. And in truth, his thinking had already begun to change. After living for more than seven months within a modern house, how could one get used to shitting in buckets again? He felt it very weird to do, and a little awkward. But before, he wouldn't have minded to even do his business in front of everyone, as peasants generally didn't have a choice of these matters. For them, plumbing was a distant dream, which meant that there was no running water and no way to flush any poop away. One should know that even in noble estates, as well as the palace, there was no such thing as privacy, except to the king or patriarch, apart from shitting in buckets and passing them along to the butlers. The royal also made several shitholes as well. You know, just in case your bucket was full and you needed to go right now. Bottom line, privacy wasn't really a thing. Anyway, these shitholes were just benches with holes on them. So one bench could have up to 12 holes on them. The place was open to both male and female. So when you do your business, you might be sitting close by to another woman or man, who's producing weird sounds from their ass as well. These holes all lead to several buckets and basins within the shit rooms, where servants would go in and empty later. They just had to pray that no one's poop would drop on them when they were taking out the load. And worse, if someone accidentally dropped their keys within the hole, the servants below would have to swim in shit just to get them. Of course, since most places had noble, peasant, and slave benches, everyone was used to doing their business in front of the world. But now that Tim had started doing his business in private, how could he feel comfortable pooping in front of others? It was just weird, okay? Just thinking about how he had shown his ass here and there in the past, he couldn't help but blush a little from embarrassment, especially when he remembered that some of the women had seen it. Ugh. Kill him now. Both men walked and talked as they made their way towards Tim's office. Well, since you're already busy, I won't take too much of your time. Take a look at these. I need you to select some of the construction workers to start building two new industries. Landon said, while passing on his architectural design plans to Tim. Tim quickly took them and read the names of each project. Project 1. Diaper and Sanitation Pad Manufacturing Industry. Oil Making Industry. Yup. Landon wanted to make these ones as soon as possible. At first, he had thoroughly forgotten about the first one. But after he accidentally saw Lucy's stains, he couldn't help but put this on the list. No matter how technologically advanced they were. Women would always need sanitation pads, and babies would always need diapers. In Landon's mind, these projects must be completed before the end of the year. In this era, women just used torn rags as pads, and would wash them up later or throw away. The problem with those, was that they didn't absorb much, so women still ended up leaking very frequently. Again, some would also cut the hair of animals like sheep, and stiff down there for better absorption. But the problem was that it would always leave their privates itchy, and sometimes infected. Again, one other reason why Landon had decided to make sanitary pads was because he had also gotten a very funny report from the hospital. They had reported that several people had come to the hospital saying that they were sick, just because they had started seeing their period every month. One had to know that in ancient times, women saw their period once or twice a year and also reached menopause around the ages of 25 to 30, that's why they married early. But the reasons for all of this were just too many. Firstly, they were too stressed. Stress was a big one. Even back on Earth, some students, or overworking women, would miss their periods for a month or two just because of exams or project deadlines. Now imagine these women who were constantly stressed till they died. It was even a miracle that they even saw them periods at all. And on top of that, their nutrition was trash, and they worked like slaves and robots. One should know that poor nutrition and too much hard work meant that these women had extremely low body fat. But that was the problem. Women needed a certain amount of body fat to keep their reproductive system healthy, as well as slow down menopause. Back on Earth, only girls with severe eating disorders. Cowed ever suffer from such, and that percentage was less than 1%, but here, Almost every woman had this problem, 
Even noble women were stressed. You think scheming, plotting and so on was easy to do? All of them suffered in their own little way. When looking at everything, it was no wonder that the women here would freak out about seeing their periods more than once or twice a year. But this also showed that they had been eating better and were less stressed compared to their previous state. For the human body, even if it has suffered from deficiency for several years, that did not matter. It would still heal up fast regardless. For example, just because one had a tumor for three years doesn't mean that treatment had to take three years to do. Likewise, even though these women had suffered for years, within this period of his reign, their cheeks had become more fuller and rosier when compared to their previous skeleton zombie-like appearances. At that time, their jaws, arms and bodies were so skinny and malnourished that Landon had sometimes felt like if he made them work for more than three hours a day, their bones would instantly snap in a half. But now, they looked like the regular people that Landon was used to seeing back on Earth. Their bodies had taken up enough nutrients, their stress levels had gone down drastically, and now, their periods had come more frequently. Even the nurses were shocked with their own bodies as well, as some of them had also thought that they too had reached menopause. And that wasn't all. Some women between the ages of 33 to 36 had also become pregnant and had called it a Baymard miracle. They went to the church and sang their praises there in joy. As they cried while holding their babies, Landon didn't know whether to laugh or cry at their proclamations. It was indeed a miracle. Bottom line, because of all this, Landon had no choice but to make sanitation pads SAP. As for diapers, babies here were just tied with cloth. And how effective was this? Erm, if you pee on yourself, will it still leak out? Yup. So diapers were also a must. Well, that was it for the diaper and sanitation pad manufacturing industry. As for the oil making industry, there wasn't really much to elaborate on. Oils already existed in Baymart as he had requested for them to be made before his last mission. They were used by the spas, and some of them were also sold at the stores as well. Baymard had only produced six different body oils. Two were spa ones, and four were body lotions for men, women, children, and babies. Right now, all Landon wanted was for an industry to be built for them, so that they could move out of the alchemy industry as well. And when looking at the construction time frame, Landon expected the first industry to be done around November, and for this oil one to be done in October. Your Majesty, consider it done. I will select at least 2,000 workers to start construction on both industries promptly, Tim assured, as he escorted Landon out of the premises. Hum, that'll be for the best. After finishing up with Tim, Landon looked at his time and finally decided to head towards the hospital. It was time to treat Adrian.